We are very blessed today. Sean Ferris, her and her husband Jeff have been members here since 1994. 26 wonderful years. She is a school teacher by education and a woman of God and uh, is leading a Bible study in Pecan that is reaching people in that part of our community for Christ. And you are in for a treat. Sean, come right on. <laughs> Good to see you all. In 1853, a great missionary named Hudson Taylor traveled to China. He went on board a, sh a sailing vessel, and when that ship got close to or between the uh, peninsula of Malai and the island of Sumatra, it came to a stop. In a, just a few minutes, an urgent knock came to the stateroom door of where the missionary was staying. He opened the door, and to his surprise, he saw the captain of the ship. The captain said, Sir, I believe that you are a praying man, that you know the Lord, and I need you to pray for wind. Well, Mr. Taylor said, Yes, sure, I can do that, but I need you to do something. I need you to set the sail. Well, that's crazy, said the captain. That would be ridiculous. There's not even a breath of wind or a breeze out there. What would the sailors think of me? <laughs> but nevertheless, he relented after a little time, and he went and set the sail. Forty-five minutes later, he returned to find the missionary still on his knees. He said, sir, you can get up now. We have more wind than we know what to do with. Let me pray. Father God, you are so good to us. We are so blessed to be here in this house together and by virtual wherever you are. God, you are there. Father, we thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your love. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to individual hearts that are willing to hear. As only you can, you are the deliverer of the word. And I praise you and thank you and give you all the glory today. Amen. Yes. Well, for several months before the lockdown, Pastor Allen had been taking us on a journey through Genesis, and he was in the part of Genesis where he was teaching us about Abraham. Abraham's story spans from Genesis 12 all the way to Genesis 25. So he was about there where I got a word from God, <laughs> and on March 29th, I was due to bring that word. Well, that was our first Sunday closed. <laughs> so I thought, okay, God, we'll, we'll see what, if you want me to do this. Um, now I have an opportunity again to share that word from then, but I feel like it's more important for now than even then. So back in November, I was asleep, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I heard three statements come into my mind. And I thought, this sounds like a sermon. <laughs> it sounds like a three-point sermon. And I haven't been a Baptist in decades. <laughs> you know they're very well known for their three-point sermons. I just got three lines, and then I went back to sleep. The next morning I woke up, and I said, God, can you fill in the blanks here? Because I think this is a word for the church. And he did just that. He led me into Abraham's story. I saw a couple of things there that I'd never seen before. And... That's where I went with it. Um, today, I'm going to share a little bit of Abraham's story, and then I'm also going to parallel that with one of my own personal stories. So here are the three points that I received in the middle of the night. Receive the promise, contend for the promise, rest in the promise. Point number one, receive the promise. The Bible is full of promises to us. Everett K. Storms, he was a Canadian school teacher, on his 27th reading through the Bible, he concluded that there are 8,810 promises in the Word, with 7,487 of them being direct promises from God to humankind. Receiving a promise comes from a place of need or desire. Abraham had a need, a rightful heir. He did have a servant. His name was Eleazar, and he was due to inherit all of Abraham's riches. 
because he had no children. God had given him this promise right here, Genesis 15, 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one, Eleazar, shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Abraham received the promise, and he believed the promise. 27 years ago, I had a need. I was a young wife and mother living in San Antonio, we were at the time. And I thought, well, you know, it might be time to go get a checkup. I hadn't done that in a long time. So I went to a doctor that Jeff recommended. It was his doctor, and he was actually an exercise cardiology specialist. Well, he was listening to my heart, as they always do. And he said, did you know you have a heart murmur? I said, hmm, nope, 33 years old, mm mm-mm. Uh, He said, you know, it could have been there from birth and it just went undetected, or it could have developed over time. I want to do another test on you. I said, okay. So I went and got an echocardiogram. It's a sonogram of the heart. So I go back to the doctor and he tells me, well, you have the most rare form of a heart murmur. It's called an aortic insufficiency. So he proceeded to explain there's four chambers of the heart, there's four valves, and the one that wasn't working on me was the aortic valve. It's where the left ventricle of the heart, the strongest part of the heart, releases the blood into the aorta, the most large vessel in the body, and takes it to the rest of the body. Well, my heart was letting the blood go, but it was also letting some back in. So that made the heart work a little harder. I said, okay. What do I do about this? He said, well, you just live your life. You go on your exercise routine, and if you get shortness of breath, call us. I said, oh, okay. I went home, and I thought, oh, I didn't go home yet. He told me that in 25, 30 years that I would need a valve replacement. No big deal, just a little surgery. We'll just take that and put a little pig valve in there. No problem. I didn't like that idea for me. I'll tell you why. (laughs) I totally believe that God has given us medicine, doctor, surgery is a blessing from God. But for me, I thought, "Mm mm-mm. I had two parents. My sister's over there, her parents too. Um, They died right around the age of 60, both of them, from heart disease. So at a young age, I thought, well, I'm going to live a little different. And then when I find out I have this, hmm, our mother also had a faulty valve from having rheumatic fever as a child. So her heart gave out too young, and I thought, you know, God, I don't want to look forward to that. So I received the promise of healing. Next point, contend for the promise. Contend to find means to struggle or surmount a difficult situation, to assert something as a position in an argument. Contending sounds like work, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> Hey, Sarah, Sarah. When I was a young Christian, I became a disciple of Christ. I always believed in Jesus from a very young age, but I became a disciple 30 years ago. When I was learning about the Lord and I was with the body of Christ, I noticed that some people lived kind of a hey, Sarah, Sarah Christianity is what I thought it was. That's a song <laughs> that came from the 1950s, and if you ever remember singing this song, I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to go through the words. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, what will be, will be. So I noticed that people were living like, okay, whatever comes my way in life must be God. We'll just let it ride, let it roll. He'll be there with me. Oh, yes, he's with you. But I chose to live a different type of Christianity than just letting things happen. No case of Ross or Ross for me. All right. Um, when contending for something that we believe God wants for us, we must put our faith in action. We need to put it to work. God has done his part by sending his only son, one and only son, to the cross. Jesus the Christ took all our sin upon him. Our sin, our shame, our sickness, and our pain. Let's look at Isaiah 53, a little short passage. 
Surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. This word griefs in the Hebrew means sicknesses. And the word sorrows in Hebrew means physical pains. Also, those words born and carried, they refer to the atoning work Christ did on the cross in taking our sins. We know this because those two words are found elsewhere in the Bible. He has given us, through all that he went through, he gave us the gift of salvation, sozo. Sozo is a Greek word. It translates as saves, which in its fullest form means heals, delivers, makes whole. Sozo appears over 100 times in the New Testament. The work of salvation is finished. Christ did it on the cross. Amen. Let's look at Philippians 2.12. I put B because it's the second part of that passage. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is a kind of an unusual verse that maybe has tripped some people up because they think, well, oh, do I have to work to be saved? Do I need to do good works and then God will see me fit to bring him into the kingdom? No, that is not what this means. (laughs) Those words, fear and trembling, do I have to be terrified? Well, if God walked in the room right now, we'd probably be terrified. But it means more so that we are in awe. We have reverence for our God. That's what we think when we see fear. The salvation here in the, is the Greek word soteria, which is the noun form of sozo, and it means deliverance, soundness, prosperity, rescue, well-being. What a promise. So what about our work? What is our work? It is to access what Christ has already done for us. You know, he did his part. We just talked about that. Now it's our turn to do our part. Do you remember the story? The sail. The captain had to set the sail before the wind came. The true living faith with which the Holy Spirit instills into the heart simply cannot be idle. This is Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Refor- Reformation. You know, God could have handed us a baked cake of faith, but he didn't. He gave us ingredients to put it together on our own. No, he will help us, but we have to do that. So what are some of these ingredients? There's five I'm going to talk about. Number one is to renew your mind to the will of God through his word. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. We do this by immersing ourselves in the word. We read it, and not even that, we meditate on it. We let God speak to our hearts through it. We listen to it. I am a fan of the audio Bible. Is anybody else? Yeah. You know, I can put on the audio Bible. I can clean house. I can do things that I need to do during the day. I can drive, and I can still get the word in my mind, transforming me, renewing my mind. Do whatever's best for you. Some of us are audio learners, and it's just best to hear it. Plus, we can do those other things in the same time. Um, The more we expose our minds to the truth, the more we become persuaded and convinced of the truth. Isn't that true in any area that has truth? So what you need to do is find specific scriptures that apply to your situation. This is what I did. I went home with that diagnosis, and I went to the Word. And what I did was I went everywhere. I looked up a word search. Wherever there was whole heart, W-H-O-L-E, heart together, I received that as a promise for me. I would write a little note in my Bible. It's okay to write in your Bibles, (laughs) y'all. And I would put a date. And, you know, maybe I took it out of context because it meant, with my whole heart I praise you, God. But I saw wholeness in that. 
So I did that. You know, it does take time, effort, and energy to do that, but it's so worth it, I can promise you. All right, here's another one that's not in the notes, but it's just free. You also should get involved in a Bible study. Pastor Allen was giving you opportunities. If you don't see what you can attend or want to, pray and ask God if you're supposed to start your own. Four and a half years ago, Lori and I went on a venture, and we started a Bible study in our community. And it's still going. Every Thursday morning, we meet. Some of our um, Grace girls are here. We call ourselves Grace, <laughs> because Grace is what it's all about. Um, there is one particular Grace girl here that I just have to talk about, because yesterday was a very big day for her. This is me in our pool. <laughs> This happened yesterday at 11 a.m., and this is Suzanne, or we know her as Sue Ware. And she's on the front row with her husband and her friends today. <laughs> yes, praise God. Sue came to us um, about May. She uh, was going through COVID like everybody and looking for answers. And she was fearful and concerned because we all have been there. And I came to her and I said, come to the Bible study. God has all the answers. He is the one where we will find the peace that we need in our hearts. So she started attending, and, you know, Sue grew up in church. She's believed in God and Jesus, what he did for her all her life. But she is choosing now, she's made a commitment to Christ to have a relationship with him and walk in his ways and listen for the Holy Spirit. What a blessed day that was. Oh, we also have a picture afterwards. <laughs> this is Sue and I. Grace is what we're all about. What a big day. We just rejoice with her in this new step in her walk with Christ. Yay. I also heard that here at this church, we were out of town, but four people were baptized last Sunday. Yay. God is on the move. He is. All right. Here is the ingredient number two. Pray to access or grab hold of the promise. Three points. Pray in faith believing. We are not beggars. I know that sometimes we are desperate and we cry out to God and say, Jesus, help me, and that's all we can do. That's okay, but you know, as sons and daughters, we are not called to beg. Faith is what pleases God. So we have to pray in faith believing. How do we do that? Get back in that word. Find out what God has to say. Step two, receive prayer. If you have a need, don't be ashamed to call someone for prayer. To get prayer is a very important. My sister Debbie, you know her as Deb, <laughs> we were at, went to a conference after, well, it had been a couple years after I'd gotten a diagnosis, and a sweet man called everybody forth. Whoever wanted healing, come down. I was right there. He prayed for me. I told him what was going on. And he said, your heart has been made whole. It is done in the name of Jesus. I went down. The power of God came on me, and I was down. And when Lord, the Lord was finished with me, I got back up. And, you know, I just knew in my heart, I knew in my, new, my knower, it was done. I knew I was healed. I just felt that I was. Of course, I had done my work in the Word, but I was there. Um, and the next place thing, very important thing, is pray for others who need the same promise. This is very important. Research shows that when we pray for others, there is a 68% increase in our own healing. That's measurable. So let's pray for others. Let's look at Genesis 20, a couple of scriptures here. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Well, this is just a little tiny snippet. Just give, me, give you some context. Abraham and Sarah had come into the kingdom of Abimelech. This is one of those um, boo-boos Abraham made where he told the king that his wife was his sister so that his life would be spared and... They took her away into the kingdom. Well, that was the wrong thing to do for Abraham. He was the leader of the household and kind of messed up there. And a curse came upon the whole kingdom of Abimelech. 
all of the females became barren. Well, the king said, I guess this is, we need to send this Sarah back. They sent her right back. And Abraham prayed for them to be healed. He had a need. His wife was past the, bear, the bearing age of children. And God had said he would have a child from his own body. So he prayed for them, and they became healed. Ingredient number three, worship. Oh, worship is so important. I know you know that. This is a worshiping church. So important. It's how we fight our battles. We give thanks to God when? Before the promise is fulfilled. We thank him for who he is, all he's done, and for all he's yet to do. Pray, praise him first. Jeff had a, a wonderful teaching called Altar of Sacrifice, I think, last year. Look it up and enjoy that. All right, ingredient number four, obey. Obedience brings us closer to God as we trust his ways over our own. When God asks us to do it his way, let's just do it. He knows better than we do. You all have individual stories. I'm not giving you a formula for success. I'm giving you biblical principles that if you will take them and apply them to your own situation and let God lead you and tell you how to do it, you never know. Could just get that promise. <laughs> do it his way. All right, step number five, ingredients. Number five, activate faith. Romans 12, 3, the second part, the B part. God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Abraham did believe, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And because of that, he received the promise. So in this passage, it tells us that God has given, a, given each of us a measure of faith. And it comes when we believe in Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, and when we become saved, we all get that measure of faith. What is faith? I could talk on this for weeks. <laughs> faith is believing God and trusting God. Pistis is the Greek word meaning to believe. Now, Abraham, he was in the era of the Old Testament where the Hebrew was. Let's see what the Hebrew word means. Amon, it means to be fully persuaded, believe soundly, solidly, and to consider trustworthy. So did Abraham just believe, or did he walk in faith? He knew that this is what that means. Trust God in the midst of this. So we have this measure of faith. Our, okay, did I go past? Yes. Our faith can grow. We don't have to say, more faith, God, give me more. Take what you got and grow it. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. Luke 17.5, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. This right here <laughs> looks like a balloon. It is a balloon. But this is your faith. <laughs> this is your measure of faith. And in Romans 10, 17, it says, faith comes by hearing. Does my balloon have a hole in it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah, I did the stretching of it. There we go. <laughs> Faith comes by hearing. And hearing. <laughs> Keep on hearing. And hearing. My faith has grown. Your faith will grow. Do we tie it off? Maybe. But you know what? We live in the... And a really interesting time of fear and doubt and uncertainty and not knowing what is coming, please do not let go of your faith. <laughs> do not do that. <laughs> All righty. Faith. 11, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. Substance is the Greek word hypostasis, which means to stand under. Faith is that exercise of mind and soul which has for its object things not seen but hoped for. The Lord asks us to declare our faith by saying that we have hypostasis, or the stand under, of that which we are believing for and hoping for. Do you need healing today? Do you need provision from God? Do you need salvation for your loved ones? Then come and stand under that which you're hoping for. This is the substance, the stand under. This is our part. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, Abraham gave us an example of this. Romans 4.20. He did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. The word stagger, that's what fear and unbelief make us do. But faith, hypostasis, <laughs> comes under and supports and holds steady. We're not going to stagger, right? We don't want to stagger. Fear and unbelief will do that. Do not buy fear and unbelief. It comes straight from the pit of hell. Come against it and walk in faith. Fear and unbelief are not our portion. They, it comes. We need to deal with it and ask God to help us, and he will. So Abraham had faith, although that which he believed for was humanly impossible. That which I believed for was humanly impossible. You know, I went back to, um, I didn't go back to the doctor. I received that prayer. I believed that I was healed. I should have gone back to the doctor <laughs> just to confirm so I could testify. Well, do you know, we were a young family, and echocardiograms, was, it was not covered by our insurance. And it was about $500 at the time, and I thought, I don't want to spend that just to show that I'm healed because I already believe it. Well, about 10 years goes by. <laughs> And I feel like the Lord's dealing with me. Would you go get that checked out so then you can give your testimony? I did. I went to my now doctor in Granbury, and he did an echocardiogram. I had to pay for it. And it came back. His heart is normal. There's no, no problem at all, no issues. <laughs> Praise God. Give him all the glory. Step number, th or point number three that I got in the middle of the night, rest in the promise. Back to Genesis 20, a couple verses earlier. Abimelech said to Sarah and Abraham, See, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. There comes a time when your faith in God, granting your promise, becomes, has grown to the point where you fully believe and you fully trust. That is where when you rest in this area of your life. Will our faith ever be perfected? No, <laughs> not this side of heaven. But we will have many, many opportunities to practice. And each time we get the victory, it gives us strength and fortitude to keep going. But you know, Abraham wasn't perfect. <laughs> we know that by looking at his story. None of us are. But we know that God loves to work through the imperfect. And that's me, one of them, and y'all too. <laughs> so when Abraham was able to just go dwell where it pleased him, we don't know how long they were there. It doesn't say. But we do know that it was 25 years be between the time that Abraham got the promise in Romans 12 and all the way to the fulfillment was 25 years. He was 75 when he received the um, promise, his wife was 65. He was 100 years old when it came to pass when Isaac was born from Sarah, his wife. God had confirmed this promise seven times, his perfect number, along the way in Abraham's journey of faith. And then he came to the point where it was time to rest and wait on God, waiting on the promise. Let's look at Psalms 37, verses 3 and 7. Trust in the Lord and do good. 
Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. So I did that resting. I did that resting for a while. <laughs> and then I received confirmation, and now I'm here testifying to everybody that God healed my heart. And I'm so thankful for that. Like I said, because of our family's history, I did not want that for me. So praise God. In conclusion, what promise of God do you need in your life? Is it healing? Is it healing in your body or your soul or your spirit? Is it provision? Do you need a job or God to help you pay your bills? Is it salvation for loved ones? Are you praying and believing and maybe it's been 25 years plus and you're still believing? Is it restoration in any area of your life? How about hope for your future? This is something we're seeing is an epidemic right now in our country, a lack of hope because of what's going on. And the young people especially are suffering. They're not seeing so much, a hope for their future. How are they going to find that hope without Christ? We need hope for our future. When we have it, then we can share it to others. This is a, an opportune time, a kairos time, an important time that we need to share the gospel. And I am blessed and privileged and honored to be able to do that in my community. And God is bringing fruit, fruit from that. And he will do that for you as well. I can promise you that there is a promise from God for that situation and any situation. Seek him and receive your promise. Contend for it and then rest in it. I'm going to pray for all of you right now of any needs you have. Father God, I thank you for the precious people that are here today and yours that are watching online or live. God, I ask that you would meet their need. Father, help them to receive a promise from God from you, from you, for their situation. Help them contend for it. Help them to rest in it when it is time. And we praise you and thank you for the bringing about of that promise, bringing the materialization from heaven to earth, that promise. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. <laughs>